Allow me to um, transition and introduce uh, Dr. Susan Lucia. Uh, she's currently the Educational Director of Professional and Organizational Development at Sierra College. Her previous job experiences included being an English faculty and member and also dean of both the liberal arts and business and technology department uh, at Sierra College. Allow me to briefly um, tell you about her research. The purpose uh, of her research was a qualitative uh, study that explored the classroom experiences of black community college students and white community college faculty to possibly uncover barriers and provide suggestions to uh, achieve a transformative learning environment. This research centers black students' narratives and then compares the findings with the classroom experiences of white faculty. This study hopes to increase the body of knowledge about inherent and unnoticed barriers in the classroom that impede the academic success of black community college students. Uh, let's give a hint to our uh, distinguished recipient of the Outstanding Dissertation for Higher Education, Dr. Susan <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, the biggest challenge was cutting down my 45 slides for my dissertation defense to less than 10. I think Tina had to tell me, you have to do it more. I'm sorry, you can't do it. So, and which I did. So, um, as um, Porphy said, my, the title of my dissertation is Listen to Me, Lessons Learned from Black Community College Students to Achieve a Transformative Learning Environment. Uh, what I want to do today is for, because of time is to just do a brief overview of my study and really this presentation is going to focus more on the discussion of my findings. So in terms of the significance of my study, um, I sought to answer this question. What is the community college education system's role, specifically white faculty, in authoring and perpetuating the achievement gap for black students? Um, as many of you may know, there's uh, black students at all levels of education have an equity gap when it comes to academic success um, at, at all levels. And so, and as well for K through 12, as well as higher education. And so what the study wanted to do was compare the classroom environments of specifically black students and white faculty, since we have at community colleges primarily white faculty, for our students, and um, even though we have primarily students of color at community colleges, and to see what suggestions can be made to, to improve that, um, to improve the instruction. What I wanted to do with this study is to upend the paradigm. Um, a lot of times, like, I'm, and I know you all have been uh, studying this, deficit thinking and, and what the types of things that we have and that we attribute to students, it's that we, we want to fix students. You know, what is going on? What's going on with them? You know, what, what can we do to help them because something is lacking? Well, in this study, we wanted to shift that paradigm, shift the focus of blame, and center black student voices in what is really going on in the classroom as a means of reform for classroom instruction. And, and as I wanted to also to look at um, racism that's inherent in our educational structure, and see, see what, what is going on in terms of narratives from both black faculty, I mean, excuse me, black students and white faculty. So here are my research questions and my design. I had, it's a qualitative study, I had two research questions. The first one was, what are the perceptions of black community college students regarding their classroom experiences with white community college faculty? And the second research question um, mirrored it. What are the experiences of white community college faculty regarding their classroom experiences with black community college students? It's a quantitative study, and I use a narrative inquiry framework. And the data I collected was through 20 interviews, um, 10 with black community college students, 10 with white faculty. And the interviews were semi-structured and open-ended. And for those of you who are doing qualitative, so 20 interviews, they lasted about Anywhere from one hour was the shortest to two hours. I have over 500 pages of transcripts. Um, it was super fun, seriously. So. <laughs> Actually, it was really interesting. If you like to talk to people, qualitative is, it was, changed my life. 
<laughs> no, it's not to be nervous. You can do it. Okay. Um, so, uh, for in terms of the one after I quoted and, and analyzed um, the research, I came up with five themes, and the themes were connection, white privilege supremacy, individual individuality, educational institutional practices, and then teaching practices. Um, in addition to that, I had a question about the overall experiences um, with black students with white community college faculty and as well as white communi community college faculty with black students. So right now, just for this discussion, I'm gonna focus on three of the themes, um, connection, white privilege, supremacy, and educational institutions, as well as talking about the overall experiences. So in terms of the overall experiences, what was really interesting was out of the interview, seven black students versus two white faculty rated their overall experience as, faculty, as positive. Um, in when, uh, the two uh, theoretical frameworks that I used was critical race theory, I said, oh, that one, right, okay. Delgado, got it, okay. And um, Lance and Billings and Tate. And then also Black Crit, um, really the work of Dumas and um, Dumas and Ross and Leonardo, um, which suggests, um, for, so for this, the fact that seven black students versus two white faculty, that was a stark comparison, uh, contrast for me. And it suggested there is a framework that, that there is still racism embedded in the classroom. However, and that micro, microaggressions do exist because seven students also rated that, yes, we, I did have microaggressions against me within the classroom with white faculty, but, but they still rated their overall experience as positive. So what, so it was, so one person said, well, that means maybe something's not happening there. Maybe everything's good. White faculty are doing great. No, it's, I see shaking heads in the back. Absolutely. What that does suggest, especially when looked through the framework of black crit and critical race theory, is that black students have had to find a way to navigate. So much so that the racism is embedded and it's subsumed and they kind of think that's the way it is. And so who knows what is happening in there? And remember, we're, this is all up against equity gaps for black students across the board. So, so and, and, and what was even more interesting, faculty rated their, I know it's not an overall positive experience for me. So when asked why it wasn't an overall positive experience for them, it was, well, I feel like I'm not relating to my students, um, I'm, I'm not meeting their needs, um, you know, something's going on there. No, really, I don't, not one faculty member mentioned their discomfort as I might be racist in the classroom, but something else, something else that is happening. So they not even realizing that in terms of racism and that that intersection of power and structure and racism that could be happening and they could be inadvertent perpetrators of that system, that was not something that really came to mind. So in terms of the theme of connection, uh, eight black students, and remember this is out of 10, so this is about 80%, said it was important for instructors to care about their success and to form a connection. Five white faculty said they do make an extra effort to connect with black students, so that was about 50%. So what's really interesting here is, is what a lot of the white faculty reported about this particular theme was that it's the student's lack of trust regarding them where they can't make that connection. Again, maybe legit. I mean, this is how they really felt. The faculty I, I interviewed were very um, passionate instructors, but you see that that is, again, this is the black students not making a connection with me. So CRT and black pr framework suggests that it may be difficult, though, another explanation for faculty to connect with them because of the faculty's um, perceptions, biases, and prejudices. And, and as we all know, um, maybe biases that are not even realized. And so Polito tells us that while it's uncomfortable, this is not, I, I have to say throughout my study, there was tensions all around. My phenom type is white, even though I don't identify as white, my ethnicity. And I can't tell you the types of questions that I got asked, especially when it comes to the white-black binary. Um, people got defensive very easily. And I was also accused of a lot of things like, who do you think you are doing this research? That type of thing. Um, and so, so in, in terms of, of, of the framework and, and understanding connectedness, seeing that eight black students said it's very important, if we don't name it, as Polito has said, you have to name the offense, but only by naming it, whether you say it's white privilege or white supremacy, it's only by naming it can we hope to do something about it. 
The next theme I want to talk about, which really leads to it, is white privilege supremacy. So in the study, seven black students said their classroom experiences and behaviors are affected by experiencing or anticipating experience, um, stereotype and prejudice. Just even anticipating it, their classroom experiences were affected. On the other hand, four white faculty said the lack of trust may be rooted in racism, and three said it was important, three of the 10, I, I, you know, said it was important to continually check your own, the faculty's biases and assumptions. So the findings suggest a realization, a realization, excuse me, by black students that education is not race neutral, as Leonardo suggests. But there's also a normalcy of it in the classroom, and, and I don't want to say acceptance, but that it's it's a normal thing in the classroom, as because seven remember seven students rated their experience as overall positive. Um, most of the students totally um, agree stereotype threat exists. Seven said that they've either experienced it or expecting to experience it in their um, time at college. Um, but white faculty don't recognize that their own biases and assumptions, how that can adversely affect the classroom experiences. It happens, I've heard, but it happens to other people. Other people do it, I don't do it. And the findings suggest that, that overall there is a lack of interrogation on the part of white faculty regarding their role as a dominant group and, and not only their instructional practices, but what that framework does in terms of success for black students in a community college classroom. And finally, the last thing I want to cover is educational teaching structures. And this was another one that was like, whoa, what's going on? Um, so in educational teaching structures, eight black students reported the benefit of a learning cohort model, where one white faculty member said there was a benefit to a learning cohort model. Uh, that one surprised me. And so um, the one thing for the research really bears out about the support for a, a cohort model. Um, Education Trust West talks about how community is very important in building attainment um, uh, for, for students and especially for um, historically underrepresented and underserved students. Uh, and, and that, you know, people understand that. But what was most interesting to me was white faculty's belief that that type of learning cohort model, where um, I don't know how many people of you are familiar with community colleges, um, there's a program called the Emotion Program. Does anybody? Um, yes, okay. Um, and this is a program for success and retention of African American students. Um, and I taught in that program for three years um, as an English faculty member. Uh, but it was uh, it over uh, more than once, white faculty that I interviewed said, well, I'm not exactly sure if this learning cohort model is, um, uh, is, is effective for black students because it's not the real world. This is not how they have to navigate the real world. So again, it again points to some destructive effects of the black white binary. So the implications of this study, and, and I was asked this when I was doing my proposal defense, uh, one of my uh, committee members said, not that member, <laughs> said, um, and, and, and I like this question so much, although it threw me for a loop in my proposal defense, um, that I put it into my dissertation defense. Is this study an indictment of white faculty? And I really had to think of that, and probably some of you are going, what the heck is going on? What is, you know, that type of thing. And, and some of the feedback I got totally said that. And so I had to really think about this. And, and I came up with, it's not really an indictment of white faculty exactly, right? Um, Johnson Bailey suggests that educators might not understand their own positionality, where they are, as we all know, education is a very hierarchical process. We can kind of try and break down the barriers, but we the fact that we give grades is really difficult to, to, to how how do we how do we do what Veta says and, and dialogue and, and students become teacher and teacher becomes students in this structure that we have. So if there is an indictment of anything, it's an indictment of a system that the white faculty are subsumed in that may be reinforcing and perpetuating racism in the classroom that adversely affects our black students. And so what, um, what I tried to do with the study and, and when, through the analysis is to find something that white faculty, a model that white faculty can use to understand and continually interrogate their own positionality. So what I came up with was a model, a model called positional, positionality consciousness working toward creating a transformative learning environment. Um, you notice that it's circular, 
Um, rather than linear, unlike um, a model like Helm's identity model that is linear where it goes through steps, this is circular because at any time, I, it, I, I think that embed, racism is so embedded in our educational structure that at any time, no matter how much education you have, no knowledge, um, that you can be in any of these areas at any time, and we have to continually interrogate ourselves and our actions. Um, so one of the, they're made up of four components. One of the components is denial. Denial is the belief exists that racism is not really a factor in the classroom. Of course we have racism in society, but in education, especially in higher education, we know better. It doesn't really exist in our classroom. The next, um, then there's acceptance. An acceptance is an intellectual accept acceptance of racism and white supremacy in education. Maybe not necessarily something that we individually, as learned faculty, are guilty of, but, but okay, I'll give it to you, it exists. Then there's personal awareness. It's an acceptance of one's own role in perpetuating white supremacy in the classroom. And I have to say that when I, when people are much more comfortable talking about white privilege, you know, Lipton and, and um, some of the, the other white privilege instead of white supremacy. Um, what is being experienced here is white supremacy is the, the factor, it, it, it is. And so that, that acknowledgement of it um, is the first step in, in doing something about it. And finally, the last thing is humility and love. Um, and it addresses the hierarchical teacher-student dynamic and approaches teaching from a position of humility and love. Um, at Moja, that program that I taught in, they have three heartbeat practices and one is teaching with humility, teaching with love. When I would talk to people about it, they would say, oh yeah, I'm totally doing that. It's really easy to think you're doing it and very difficult to actually put it into practice. So why did I do this study? Um, I first, um, before I do that, I wanna read uh, a quote that was from one of the students um, that I interviewed. I might express how I feel with more people I feel comfortable with, as opposed to an environment where I feel like I'm going to be shunned to a degree for speaking those truths. This was a sober, for me, you know, you all are gonna go through a dissertation and it is a process that has fundamentally changed my life. And I don't know if it was because of the, the topic that I had, the process, and I guess it's a combination of both. Um, it's sobering to realize what I was trying to do and there's so many tensions in this. I mean, I'm talking about breaking down a hierarchy and I am profiting from the system. I, my, my doctorate has profited me in my life um, in, in my personal life and in how I view things. And then again, I'm talking about a hierarchy that is, is structured racism and that we are leaving students, our marginalized, underrepresented, and underserved students behind. What do we do about it? Um, so thinking that I could find the answers to this was super, was naive. Um, I, I struggled with it. Am I even perpetuating racism just by doing this, just by being in this process? Um, but as Bell says, Rather, it is a question of both and. Both the recognition of the futility of action and the unalterable conviction that something must be done, that action must be taken. And so my hope with this study is that it would put forward an understanding, a first step of what is happening in white faculty's classrooms with black community college students and be a humbling first step to possibly removing barriers and inequities and just end to do the right thing. Thank you. I have a question that you may have. Yeah. I'd like to ask the yeah. same question about what you learned, but I wanted to add a second one. You talked about um, the overall positive experience. I was just wondering how you defined that. Uh, the question was, um, uh, Overall, did you, uh, what is a positive experience that you had? And overall, uh, did you have, overall, would you rate your experiences as positive? Overall, would you rate your experience as negative? It was a very straightforward question. Okay. And so, and it was, and it was, so, and I probably, I mean, I'm trying to think of the exact question. And it was, all my questions in the, the two set of interviews mirrored each other so that I could get a, a clear picture of what they, they did or, or what was happening in the classroom. And so, um, so yeah, it was it was a very simple, very straightforward question. And so, uh, and with it, you know, I have to tell you, semi-structured in interviews are the way to go. 
My interviews were an hour to two hours because what you're doing is you're riffing off the questions. So we did it and what they gave me, then you know you went through it. But yeah, it was it was a very straightforward question. And so and I compiled it again in my in my dissertation that you can read. No, uh, um, and I just it's online. No. Um, so but in my dissertation I have a table that lists um, what the findings were. But but um, so it was it was, it was really it was really eye opening for me what they had. And then the other question okay. is what did you learn from the process of Dissertation, not so much about the topic that we can all benefit from. Uh, uh, don't get behind. I agree with Kong on that. I have to say, it is, uh, I, I appreciate um, the, the deans about don't just sequester yourself. Uh, but when I look back in that year, my dissertation was never far from my mind, ever. I could be, I'm taking a break this weekend, and yeah, no, you don't. You just don't. I mean, it's, and, and it was, my kids told me I was a zombie for like 10 months. Um, they were like, oh, you're back now. Um, so I think, I think with that, I would say love your topic. Find something you're interested in. And the other thing is find people that, on for your committee, and you all are so big. We had six in our cohort. We're so lucky in one way. And so um, just find people that will push you. Um, I had three of the most awesome, wonderful, strong female professors that pushed me and did not let me get away with anything and made me think. And um, they're such a pleasure to work with. Dr. Bruno was one of them. And um, I think those, those are the two. Love your topic. And find a committee that that you don't have to love them, but you know that push you. Other, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering how you prepared for your interviews, not in the, like framing your questions, but more in terms of you're doing interviews on really sensitive topic, um, and you appear to be a white woman. Yes, like you said. absolutely. So, and I know that's how I navigate the world and how people treat me. Absolutely. Right. So how did you prepare? Ah, so it was it was tricky and tough, and and I think it was um, number one. I vetted the questions with a lot of people, um, and and I, I tried it out uh, and showed people that I trusted. Um, I also approached it. I, you know, I'm going to be honest. For what happened with me, I approach it from a real sense of humility. I approach it from a sense of I'm not. A, I want to. I want to learn from you. And this was especially. I wanted to say it was especially important with the black students I interviewed, but it was it was important with the white faculty to establish that trust because you know I had one student okay one student told me this story about how when she took a quiz she didn't get a good grade on it and so her instructor gave it back to her and said oh my gosh uh, no he didn't say oh my gosh he said. Uh, you didn't, something about you didn't do so well on it, and even someone with an opposed, uh, he, he, he made a reference to her being like a monkey. And this was an African-American student, and, and it was like, even a monkey could have done better along those lines. And then I would have a white faculty member say, but you know, really, really, it's, that, that whole it's not the real world thing um, really rocked me a little bit, because saying a cohort model of African-American students is not the real world, so maybe it's not the best model for for life, so so, but those types of things. And so okay, safe space inside. I'm going. Oh my gosh, I can't believe they're saying that. And of course, I'm like, oh, tell me more. You know, I, I mean, so, I mean I, sorry. I mean, you know, I probably shouldn't say that, but it was, but it was a very, um, it was, it was, and, and it was a place of trust, a place of no judgment, um, and and it, and it has to be established early in the interview. I mean, if it's not, we all know how tricky race relation race conversations are. And so if you don't, so it's it's establishing trust, really, really, really listening, and not trying to think of what's my next question, and, and listening to the answers so that you can you can go off of it. Um, and that's where the good stuff comes, yeah. It was uh, Olga, and then Booker, and then Dr. Wong. First of all, congratulations. Oh, thank wow, you. That, that's so Fantastic. I mean, that, that topic resonates uh, from the perspective of K-12. And I'm actually, you know, I'm thinking, wow, how can I just literally apply your recommendations to an actual um, investigation that I'm actually involved in right now that is actually affecting uh, one of our African-American families? And so 
to me, I feel very passionate about what you what you're voicing and what your your story and your journey. But knowing that this is in is in real time impacting my work in in K twelve. So I'm, I just want to let you know that I will be researching your topic. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you. And actually taking some of that, um, some of those findings and incorporating them into what you know will, will eventually be my um, my closure. Sure. If you ever want to talk, seriously, yes, Sarah Collins, right down the street. Yes, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> I have no one has my name. You can just look me up. I mean, uh, I'm the only one. So. <laughs> thank you so much. Just for the record, if it matters. Do I? So just just for the thank you. Well, so my, my ethnic makeup is I'm primarily Puerto Rican. Actually, my mother's parents immigrated from Puerto Rico. I'm from Hawaii. I grew up in, I, and, and so I'm primarily Puerto Rican, Hawaiian, and um, Portuguese with a little bit of white. Okay. Gotcha. So I guess my question is this. Something I contemplated a lot. I have no answer, yeah. and I'm considering going down this road for my research. Okay. <clears throat> the, the, the act of uh, employing predominantly white teachers Absolutely. in a predominantly school of color is a racist act within itself. Does your research address this issue at all? So, yes, in my lit review, I didn't. So, so the, the literature, of course, says that, in fact, the literature says that when you hire people of color, it's not only students of color that um, uh, that are positively affected, it's all students are positively affected. Uh, I, 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 if, is that your research? Is, is that you're going to? I have to say, uh, are you K-12 or community college? Or college? OK, and just as a side note, there is a big push in community college right now to at least at Sierra to diversify the workforce. Um, and with our equity funding, are we doing enough? Absolutely not. Are we doing enough at any level of education? I would say no. But but you're right. I mean, the right now, when I did this research, it was almost inverse. 60% of the students at community colleges identify as a, um, a student of color, a person of color. 60% of faculty, both full of part and part-time, are white. It was just inverse. And so is it? it's a real issue. And you're going to read so much literature that backs you up. So yeah. I. I it was, it was an acknowledgement. I had in my lit review. My study, they will also tell you, our fabulous professors, narrow, narrow, narrow. You want to finish. All right, so there, there, that's another one. Okay. I have another question uh, back here for you. Okay, hi. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your uh, study with us. Um, my question has to do with the geography. Did you address that in your dissertation? Because I think the findings of asking these questions in Northern California are very different from other regions of the United States or even California for that. That matter. would, that would it totally be, it was one of my recommendations for future research to broaden it. Um, so, and again, I can't emphasize this enough, narrow, 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 um, is that I did focus on a Northern Community College, uh, Northern California Community College. That was, that was the setting. Of the study. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I did not. I did not. And um, but but again, it's it is definitely. I think this topic has ramifications on all levels of um, education, as well as in different geographical areas. That would be very interesting. So two questions. Um, the first is: uh, Was there a relationship between the? The students and the faculty. So were they were there students that had been in the faculty's classes? Mm -hmm. So they were just mm -hmm. just kind of okay. Um, that would be an interesting study to do. That would be an interesting <laughs> study to do. And then um, I see that you are the director of professional and organizational yes. development, um, and I wonder how you're intending to translate um, your findings uh, into so professional. We, we have a we have a faculty union. <laughs> um, so, well, absolutely. So I. Uh, <laughs> No, and the reason I say that is I am I would love to do trainings on this research. Uh, without getting too much in the weeds, uh, faculty professional development is a 10 plus 1 purview um, in community college, right? Um, and basically what that means is faculty fill in ownership of their own professional development. I navigate carefully because I think this is so important. Uh, but what Sierra College is doing, which is where I work, is we have a push to... Um, 
reduce our equity gaps by 40% in five years. And this is a chancellor, um, the community college chancellors, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, um, it's, it's um, his goal, the chancellor's office goal, and we've adopted it. And this is going to be a part of it. Um, how specific it can get and how much I'm allowed to say, I, I really don't, you know, I'm being honest, I, I, uh, I, I tread carefully, but I do insert myself as much as possible uh, in terms of, I know some stuff, um, please listen to me if you can, and, um, but we're, we're hoping to, um, we're hoping to have uh, not only an equity mindset for faculty, but for classified professionals and managers as well, um, to really, because we think that is one way to close the gaps for our, our students, absolutely. Thank you, can we give her a hand?